Hello and welcome back. So I decided to throw some things together from the uh, the last video where we would actually um, kind of combine two ideas. So I had already shot the first IPAs and EKGs and I decided, you know what, I'm going to shoot a different one and combine it with something somebody requested. So today we're going to talk about the anterolateral STEMI or the anteroceptal versus lateral STEMI and how we differentiate. But first we have to get to the IPA portion. So this is a man of law. Let me get it up there. Man of law from Southern Pines Brewing. Um, I'm not sponsored in any way. It's just a really good uh, IPA, especially if you're if you're new to IPAs and, and uh, you're looking for an entry level. This is probably the place to go. So it doesn't have a let's see if I can get this up on camera here. It doesn't have a, a ton of the, the bitterness people often expect. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie, this is not the first one I've had. Uh, it is the first one I've had today, but it's not the first one I've had. Um, and just to get this thing going, it's it's got a really good citrusy flavor. It is, um, you can taste the grain, but it's it's not overpowering. It's not like headbutting a, a bowl of juniper berries or uh, pine trees or citrus or anything like that. It actually just, it balances out really good and it goes down smooth. Even when it's a little warm, they're actually really good. And I'm not just saying that because that's a veteran-owned brewing company. I know you guys see the Army flag in the background. It's actually really good. So uh, I picked this up at my local Teeters. Give it a shot if you like IPAs. If you don't like IPAs, it might be one of the ones you like. Not all of the ones you see on here <clears throat> will be will be ones you like, you know. Um, but some of the entry-level ones like this one or... Um, you know, the, the long hammer, you know, brand, some of those are, are where you can kind of start. So now that we've got the IPA out of the way, let me pull up the EKG that we're going to be talking about. And uh, I'll be posting this up on the video here. So what you'll see in the beginning is, is what looks like a pretty massive STEMI. And it is the problem here is that there's going to be a ton of elevation in this EKG. And this leads a lot of people to go straight to diagnoses like pericarditis or BER or e even Brugada when people are kind of kind of out there a little bit. So I actually used this EKG in lecture the other day and uh, you know, I had several interns in there. We play a game called Hot Seat. So in Hot Seat, you get an EKG assigned to you. It's placed up on the board. You know, it's massive. And you get to interpret it in front of your fellow interns, your classmates. And the idea here is it replicates that pressure of being the person in the emergency department or <clears throat> the person in, in the ambulance or the practice or whatever that everyone is looking at to interpret this, right? Um, and it, it really, really adds a component of realism there. I can tell you that um, I'm much more likely to make a mistake with a coworker looking over my shoulder than I am on any sort of... Um, chaotic scene or in a bad place uh, or you know in the ed or anything like that so while we're doing that um we get people that are kind of afraid to say and this is one of the ones we started the day out with so that's fairly common so i said all right anybody want to weigh in on this what's wrong with this picture right and uh two of them at the same time one of them said high lateral stimmy and the other said anoreceptal they looked at each other and they look at me and they say which which one of us is right and i said yes they're both right, right? So if you know about this physiology, you understand why. But if you don't, hopefully that's why you're here. So the idea behind understanding why they're both right ties into anatomy. So we get a lot of anatomy classes in medical training. Um, they masquerade around as physiology classes, but they're usually just anatomy classes. So let's talk about the anatomy and physiology that makes this what it is, right? So... And I, I'll pull up another picture here. So at the at the very top of the heart, you've got your aorta. And off of the aorta come two big openings, right? One in each direction. Um, ostia, if you'd rather use the, the $10 word. So uh, out of those two ostia, one comes off of the right and it becomes the right, right coronary artery, which is fairly obvious. And that perfuses the right atrium, most of the right ventricle, um, almost the entirety of the conduction system. And kind of handles its business on that end. Now on the left side, they get kind of shafted, right? So on the left side, that one ostia that comes out and becomes the LMCA, the left main coronary artery, is going to bifurcate. It's going to split into two. 
And one of those is going to wrap around the heart on the left-hand side. That's going to be the left circumflex. The other is the left anterior descending. So, and, and for, for those of you gurus out there, I know that there can be a third one. We're not going to talk about that here because that's what 3% of the population that has that. So we're not going to go that far in this. We're just going to talk normal hearts. So you have your, your left circumflex, you got your left anterior descending. They're both being fed off of the same pipe. Now, if you understand your EKG rules, and we'll go ahead and pull up another sort of area specific place here, you know that V1, V2, V3, and V4 are usually representative of what the left anterior descending artery perfuses, right? So V1 is septal, V2 is septal, V3 is anterior, V4 is anterior, and V5 and V6 are both lateral. And you also know that 1 and ABL are lateral. So let's say, for example, you had a clot high up on the chain or maybe some stenosis in the LMCA because of coronary artery disease or genetics or whatever have you that left you with an inability to really perfuse all that great and then you develop an acute clot, an acute whatever the case may be. You can see ischemia and injury in both of these places. So one, one fundamental point you have to take into account is that the place on the EKG that you see elevation is not representative of where the clot actually is always, right? So what you're seeing is far enough downstream that the blood that makes it past the clot is not perfusing. Now, it's usually not far down the chain, right? Um, and if you know the mechanisms by, by which it works, you kind of understand what I say when I make that statement. But that's not exactly representative of where the clot is, wherever you see elevation. It could very well be just a little bit higher. And when we talk about an organ the size of, of your fist, you know, a centimeter is a mile. It's a long way. So if, we, if we're talking about a clot just a centimeter up from where we see the elevation, that could be a huge piece of real estate. But anyway, I, I could talk about that all day. The bottom line here is the question people ask. Do we call it an anoreceptal STEMI or do we call it a lateral? And some people uh, throw those $10 words at you, right? The anoreceptal lateral. If you have to sharpen your pencil in the middle of a word to complete it, it's probably too big of a word to be used in regular everyday life. I, I like big words. I dig them. But this is one of those times where we're missing the forest for the trees when we look for where we want to put this. When we look for what we want to say. <clears throat> The more important concept here is not what we call it, what we call it in as, or what we identify in the ED or the family practice or whatever. The more important concept is to understand that there's a lot of real estate that's infarcted here. The important concept is to say, okay, there's elevation everywhere. You know, a lot of people divert straight to pericarditis. Like I said, look in AVR, there's no knuckle sign. Um, and we'll say this patient had no history, no reason to suspect that. So the bigger picture is there's a lot of real estate that's infarcted here. And can this patient compensate? Well, the answer is no. This patient will not compensate very well for very long. It's not going to happen, right? So you have elements of the septal wall. You have elements of the anterior section of the heart, as well as the lateral, right? The side. So you could be looking at you know, 30, 40, 50, 60% of the myocardium being infarcted at one time. And because it's on the, we'll call it the other side of the heart, because everybody's looking for stuff on the right side, right? V4R and all that. Because it's on the other side of the heart, some of that stuff is missed until, <clears throat> until it's a bit too late. That's what I'm talking about. Um, when the left ventricle is infarcted, as well as the septal wall, what kind of left ventricular contraction do you think you're going to get, right? Inotropy. Is your inotropy going to be great? The answer is no. You're not going to get a forceful contraction. You're not going to get a very um, complete contraction, the syncytium, right? Because the heart beats from the bottom or the top down in the atria and then from the bottom up in the ventricle. So the syncytium on which we depend is going to be out of sync, if that's not too redundant. It's going to be out, right? we're going to be missing the ability to really properly perfuse. So a patient with a lot of afterload, a patient who's in distress, things like that, these are all going to cause problems the patient's going to decompensate. So you have to ask yourself, is this a patient that goes to the cath lab? The answer is how far away is the cath lab? 
is this a patient that you have to take an hour and a half from a rural area to a cath lab and you're going to depend upon vasodilators like, um, you know, nitroglycerin, right? And pain management to really get you through the day. And of course there's aspirin in there and, and I appreciate the role of thromboxane A2 and how it prevents the growth of clots. Um, I also would caution everyone to understand that that is an over-the-counter medication and an over-the-counter dose. So when we talk about acute clotting of the heart, there's a reason that in the emergency department they reach for heparin when they want to halt a clot. Heparin's not there to dissolve clots. Heparin is there to halt the clot. There's a reason they reach for that heparin, right, instead of just handing someone four baby aspirin. So I appreciate the role of aspirin in every patient that I, I suspect is, is having a clot. They're going to get aspirin, no doubt about it. But there's a reason that there are bigger guns out there. That said, you have to ask yourself, if I have a local facility 15 minutes away and the cath lab is an hour and a half away, would my patient benefit from going to that local facility and receiving a fibrinolytic, right? So tenecteplase or streptokinase or any, any of the myriad of ones that your local emergency department may use. These are questions you need to consider, especially if you're a paramedic, right? So if you're a paramedic and you're riding in an ambulance, often enough, heparin is the biggest gun you will have access to. And that's not always on the ambulance, depending on what state you're in, what country you're in. Uh, I do understand there are more progressive, um, modalities in countries that are not America. All that said, heparin's not a clot buster. Heparin is not a fibrinolytic. So you have to ask yourself, does this patient need therapy that will allow them to, you know, sort of perfuse their myocardium until an interventional cardiologist can place a stent? Or does this patient need immediate reperfusion therapy? Does this patient absolutely positively need to take the risks of receiving a fibrinolytic right now. And if in MIs like this, the answer may be yes. It depends on relative age, you know, disease, BMI, the, the overall heart health, many of which are things we just can't identify or assume. Now, fibrinolytics carry their own risk, and this is something you got to consider. You can't just drop T and case on somebody worry-free the way you can take someone to a cath lab. So, you know, with a cath lab, you have a team, you have lots of expertise there, lots of moving parts. And all of this translates to a, a pretty high relative amount of safety for the patient relative to what they're going through. With fibrinolytics, that's not always the case. People go into pulmonary edema. Um, with T and case especially, there is a one in 100 chance that that patient will have a hemorrhagic stroke on the spot when they're administered T and case. Those were the, those were the numbers about 10 years ago. I probably should have looked them up, but I didn't know I'd be visiting on T and case in this. So these are things you have to ask yourself, you know, does the patient need immediate management by an emergency physician right now? So even if you're a physician and watching this, you know, if you're a family practice physician, you don't have all those tools available to you. You don't have fibrinolix laying around in the office usually. And even if you did, you're probably not licensing three or four people a week like an emergency physician would. So you have to ask yourself, does this person need an emergency physician right now? And if the answer is yes, because they are not physically capable, or there's a good chance that they're not physically capable of surviving an elongated trip to a cath lab, then that's a risk you want to take, right? And, you know, you're, you're lessening risk on one end and sort of incurring risk on the other. Um, be that as it may, that is the type of, of dynamic thinking that needs to happen when you see EKGs like this. So most of the people that see something like this or send me stuff like this, they say, what should I call this? I appreciate you trying to be an expert on your terminology, and I, I think that's great. But the fact is, you're missing the forest for the trees. What you really need is... Isn't that great? That's, that's the business phone, the bad phone. Um, the point you're really missing is, is you really need to be thinking, what's this patient going to do? Not what am I going to say? And you need to be trying your best to estimate some amount of how they will or will not compensate. 
And based upon that, your education, your experience, even gut feeling, that's when you start asking yourself, how do I handle this? What do I do for this patient? Can, you know, can, even if you're an emergency physician, can I have a helicopter here in five minutes that can get this patient to a cath lab in another 10? You know, in that case, is T and case worth the risk? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Right. Individual patient presentation is, is really everything. So that's the bigger picture and concentrate on that bigger picture. When that left ventricle is infarcted, that the patient's going to present with hypotension, probably tachycardia, unless they're on beta blockers. They're going to have this very limited ability to compensate. They're going to go into cardiogenic shock if not properly treated, sometimes even if properly treated. 20 or 30 minutes of emergency care cannot undo 30 or 40 years of bad heart health every time. It's nice when it does, but we can't count on that, right? And hopefully your patients won't either, but uh, we know that's not the case. All right, so that's, uh, I feel like I've kicked that horse to death. Again, uh, Southern Pines Brewery, give it a shot if you can get a hold of it. No sponsors, no conflict of interest. Nobody sends me a check. When I find something good, I try to share it with you guys, um, which is how this channel got created. So with all that said, get out there and practice.